A warm welcome to everybody. My name is Ash Giddings, Product Manager at Health Systems, specialising in systems management. In particular, I work for the, for the Halcyon brand. I've been involved in IBM I mid-range systems and, and IT in general since the year before the AS400 started shipping. So um, I guess way back there in the, in the 80s. I worked my way through various operations and support roles in travel, uh, manufacturing, finance, distribution, and managed services. So what are we, what are we talking about today? Well, IBMI has been around in various guises, as I say, from, from the late 80s. And with each new version, new release, and more recently, technology refresh, features get added. So we'll take a look at one feature in particular that's going to make over some time back, which you may or may not be aware of, but is, is quite valuable, actually. I can use it quite often. We'll then look outside the, what the base operating system provides um, into Halcyon and look at how to pinpoint sudden increases in disk space utilization before seeing how we can effectively uh, track and trend both from a green screen and from a from modern interface, let's call it a modern interface. So the data explosion. An IT manager I know worked out that by 2018, so just over two years time, 80 percent of his technology budget will be consumed by storage. Will be consumed by storage. This data will either be in the cloud or on premise or more commonly, a mixture of the two. As data is exploding throughout the world, and one recent study I read said that from the beginning of the world through to 2003, five exabytes of content was created. In 2013 alone, five exabytes of content was created every day. Another study said that the amount of data in the world is doubling in size every two years. Now, some of those statements are actually um, staggering when you think about it. And all of this data has to be, as IT professionals, has to be looked after, it has to be backed up, it has to be secured. And it's accessed now from a, we're just talking about the RBMI, it's accessed by a, a variety of other platforms and devices, which, which really is a administrator's and IT manager's absolute nightmare. A bit closer to home, help systems run an Anders and an annual industry survey in and around uh, users of IBMI. And I've, I've been privy to some of the early results that will get formally shared in the new year. And one item really stood out for me. And despite what the popular computer press make you believe, a staggering 68% of those surveyed use internal disk on IBMI as opposed to stand house disk. I would imagine that the price, the capacity, um, and the support that I gives to um, solid state this has been a factor here. Plus, like many admins I know, they like to keep IBM I resources um, away from other platforms such as uh, Linux and maybe Windows. In addition, three quarters of those questions have to look after more than two terabytes. Eight percent of those uh, people actually have to manage over 50 terabytes. And these figures are only ever going to go one way. Now, just before we delve into the, uh, into the meat of the presentation, um, as, the, uh, yeah, as we, um, I'm just going to perform one of uh, just two poll questions that will just be open for a couple of minutes. And these are, uh, these are important to help systems because they help us build a picture for what the industry thinks and does, but they also help steer our product roadmaps and give you the products that you use today. So if I launch this, uh, this poll, now I'm just going to leave that, uh, that running in the, in the background for a few minutes now before we, uh, we continue with our presentation. It'd be great if you could just, just answer those questions. So it's the first of second, first of two. And we'll just leave that running for a few more seconds and we'll, um, we'll press on. That's it. it. Looks like the results are slowing down. 
Fantastic. So we're just finding out how key automation is to you. Yes, it's key. So we've got a strong focus. B, it's got no focus at all. Or C, we tick that box and we're pretty much fully automated. Fantastic. Right. So without further ado, let's press on. Now, IDMI, many of you will be familiar with, um, with system service tools or, or SST as it's commonly known. Now, system service tools provides the ability to, to generate a, a message. You see that in the bottom, bottom to section of this screen here, it's the ability to generate a, a message, a CPF 0907 message that can be generated every hour by accessing SST and setting a, a threshold. In my top screenshot there, I've got it set to 90%, which is the default. So after when my ASP1 hits 90%, CPF0907 will be generated and it will sit on QSIS offer. And while I exceed 90%, that message will appear and it'll appear every hour. Unfortunately, no other notifications are provided. And also, if you get no ind indication that you've now dipped below that threshold. There's, there's very little tools in, in the operating system. But while we're talking about some of the some of the limits of the operating system, there's just a couple I just want to make you aware of that, that bang around in my head and some people don't know about them. Uh, firstly, it's, it's message queues. They can contain up to 75,000 messages on a single queue. And once you hit this figure, any, uh, any process or activity you've got right into that queue stops. It stops immediately unless you have that queue set to wrap. So just make sure you, within your job descriptions and your message queues, which can be obviously changed by church message queue, you have that same uh, set to wrap, asterisk wrap. Now the other uh, limit, operating system limit, I just wanted to mention was um, in and around libraries. So libraries can contain many hundreds, many thousands of objects, but the actual limit is 360,000. So once you hit those limits, applications will continue to, to function. In fact, you can still add objects to these libraries. But the key thing is you won't be able to back these libraries up. You'll actually see, if you attempt to back these libraries up, you'll actually see CPS 3770, I think it is, which means that uh, no objects saved or restored for library, and that gets generated typically on QHIST, or if you're using BRMS, within BRMS. So I strongly recommend that you keep an eye out for, uh, for that, CPS 3770. Okay. Now, this menu here, I used this many, many years ago, and I'd forgotten about it completely. And I did some research for the webinar and saw that it's come on in leaps and bounds. So, to access this menu, you simply use go disk tasks and you're presented with this, uh, this, this screen at the top here, a very simple screen, just five options on it. Um, and it's, it's kind of split into, into two, or I guess it's split into three really. You've got option one, collect disk space information. Taking option one, uh, submits a command. Excuse me. It submits a command which, which runs in batch and it should be submitted at a, at a particularly quiet time as it, as it can run for a number of hours. It submits a batch job that looks at every single object on the system and collects data such as uh, size, uh, last changed, last used, uh, the owner of the object and the percentage of disk that that particular object occupies. Now once that's run, as I say, running at a, a quiet time, as, as quiet time as, as possible, um, once that's run, you can then delve into to option two, which is print disk information. So option two works in tandem with option one. So what option one has to have completed first. So once the retrieve has, has finished, you're then free to extract the data via the, the print disk information command. So that focuses on uh, libraries, folders, objects, objects owners, uh, system information, and you can op optionally select sizes or particular names that are of interest to you. Um, this 
second screen there actually shows you the, uh, the, the job running, it's a single job. But you, as I said, obviously it allows you to, to drill into that and to produce fairly useful, fairly useful reports. Now, this is what it looks like, this option two. As I say, you can, you can get quite specific in there. And some of the reports and some of your boxes are going to be absolutely huge. So you can customize the report and produce uh, tailored reports that only look at objects over a certain size. Bottom screenshot there, size of the smallest object. So don't put an object in that's, that's too small, otherwise you'll get reams and reams of, um, reams and reams of uh, paper there. Now, I've got some, some reports here. I'm just going to share my desktop. I've got three sample reports here. So let me just share my, my screen. We go into the summer report to start with. It gives some useful information here. Nothing too high level in the summary, which is why I like it. But it, it gives you the these kind of percentages. So the percentage of disk that, that maybe user libraries take up. This is what you've got most control over. Actual user libraries, user directories, and uh, folders and documents. You've got very little control over the uh, over QSIS and the IBMI libraries and, and uh, the license internal code. But these, these top two is what, of what you have got control over. So as I say, it just provides very high level but it gives you the, it gives you the, um, somewhere to start. It gives you a, a starting point. You can then run other reports that, that drill into a little bit more detail. If I go into another report here, um, library summary, here we go. Again, we've still got the same information at the top here, but what we've got here, I think this is just a, uh, this is the report just showing me the sizes of, of libraries on this particular box, my test partition here, that exceed a certain value. As you can see, it is a test partition, so I've got next to nothing on it other than um, some internal applications. So I wouldn't expect on your box the, the QGPL would be the, um, the, the largest library, but you can see at a glance it's sorted by size of, um, size of disk and the size in bytes that, um, that it occupies on the disk. And it provides you with, again, the next layer. You've got, you can see QGPL here. You can then drill into QGPL and see why it's occupying 19%. Again, it's layer two. You've got the summary, you've got the library summary, and you can then go a step lower. If we go a step lower here. So this is looking at specific objects. Again, you've got the same, same header here that's telling you the same kind of information, telling you summary information. But what I've, uh, what I've done here, I've said I, I, I'm not interested in, uh, in QGPL. I want to look across my whole box. So I want to, in effect, look in a, look in a flat mode. And I just want to know the, the biggest object. So these are the big, biggest objects, irrespective of library. So you get the object name, you get the library name, you know, the type, you know, the size. Again, you can go and look at those objects and find out a little bit more information about them. Now, I think this, 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 these three um, examples give you a, a great head start because we see all organic disk growth growing uh, time after time after time, and we just accept it. We just let it grow because we don't know what's causing it. We just we just take it as one of those things that things are going to grow. But there's um, there's some great reports in there, so I, I definitely encourage you to, uh, to use those. Right. So we go back to the presentation. Now, we saw earlier that organic disk growth is pretty much accepted out there. But what can we do about sudden surges, sudden surges in disk growth? So in my opinion, growth spurts are much more of a concern as they can indicate maybe a, a looping job or a looping process that's right in a way to maybe a physical or a, or a spool file that has no threshold gates. We've all seen situations where 
watching uh, maybe displaced occupancy grow beyond 70, beyond 80, beyond 90%, and still it continues as it heads towards 100%. I can hear everybody, everybody nodding here. And we've seen the panic as, as administrators attempt to identify what the root cause is. Now, wouldn't it be great to get an early warning signal that this space is heading north and to give you a bit more time before that dreaded abnormal IPL and fingers crossed the, uh, the normal recovery. Now, Halcyon has built this into, a, an, into an easy use, easy to use rule. So what you see on here, if I explain this, uh, what you see here uh, is, let's get the pen, there we go. Uh, statistic field, so the use percent change field. This is, this is something that we've added fairly recently. And the use percent change basically says, I don't care if, you, if, if you're growing, that's, that's great, we accept that. But I want to know if you've grown, and this is, this is basically saying use percent, if you've grown by five, that's five percent, in a particular time frame, and the time frame we're looking at here is, is 30. It could be minutes, hours, days, weeks, months. It's going to change on a, I guess, a, an installation by installation, even by an LPAR by LPAR. So Halcyon identifies those sudden surges. So as soon as you get a, a spike, Halcyon's going to raise an alert. That alert can be absolutely anything. A email, SMS, pager message, um, a visible or an audible alert. It can even run a command, so it can, I don't know, maybe clear a, a temporary or a de development library for you if you hit that particular surge. It can do absolutely anything. Now, the great thing with this is the bottom option there, open alert option. What we're saying there is if we detect it and it, it drops down during this interim period, if it drops down during this interim period, I want you to close the alert. It's no longer valid. So we always, Halcyon always has a, like a current picture of how the machine looks right now, not how it looked an hour ago or four hours ago or overnight. So what can we do with, um, with trend analysis? Now, the options on the disk tasks menu are useful, but there's no simple way to compare items from, say, last week or last month or even last year to the current retrieved data. To do this, you'd need to run the reports and then from OpsNav, drag them to the desktop as text files before using Excel to extract rows, columns of interest, maybe creating pivot tables. Quite labor intensive after each scheduled uh, retrieve. Now, Halcyon allows you to run the, the equivalent of the disk task retrieve function, but we allow you to do it at, uh, at regular intervals. Uh, we're allowed to do it regular intervals, typically weekly, people run it weekly, and this enables you to this enables you to uh, to map changes across everything from the system as a whole, right the way through to groups of objects, maybe spanning different file systems, um, right down to member level. Now, bottom half of my screen here, this. Um, this is actually showing the, the data that we've collected. Top half of the screen is showing the scheduled builds. I think I run one every week. The bottom half of the screen is showing one of my latest builds. So I've got a couple of, um, let's call them special applications, all sys and all user, but I've created one called archive. So I've said a, a, a group of my libraries, I've tagged them as archive. So I can map and I can view those, those archive libraries as a, as a group. I don't want to view them individually. They're a, they're a collection, so I can manage them that way. Now, as we drill into the data, we can sort on any column. We can also toggle around to lots more information to, to aid any analysis. You can even customize your own views so just the information you're interested in is displayed. We can also use F16. So F16 sorts on any particular any particular column. So in the uh, in the 
In the bottom half of the screen here, what are we displaying on? Uh, so in the top half of the screen, we're displaying on an object size. But as I say, we can use F11. We could toggle around information such as such as um, last save, last use, whether there's source available, um, who owns it, uh, the size, absolutely anything. Anything you want to know about an object. We can create a uh, we can create a display for and display it at a glance, and this is how we do it. We do it via the via the settings, so we can drill into to anything you'd want to subset that by. Just in the bottom half of the screen here, we're looking at um, what are we looking? We're looking for big objects in effect, anything between one and five gig across um, across all user file systems. So again, you. you we allow you to see um, the trees through the wood, in effect, by pinpointing and tailoring displays. We also take it a step further. So here's an example where a customer wanted, they wanted to know, uh, they run a build every, it's every week, and they wanted to map object sizes over the six week period or over a five week period. So we created a, a format, or we helped them create a format, which is shown in, in the top screen. So they completely customized a display. So whatever they wanted on the display is shown. And in the bottom half of the screen there, you can see if we use QGPL as an example, you can see that five weeks ago it was 24 gig. It remained 24 gig until three weeks ago where it was 25, and uh, it went up to 26 and 27. So you can map it over a over a period, as I say, through the disk task menu, you can do that, but there's lots of manual steps involved. You can also see how much space that, that occupies now, nearly 20%, and what the change was between um, excuse me between the original and the, the current size. We could even go a step further than that. We could take option one against that QGPL and we can drill in to QGPL and see which objects have grown during that six week period. So whatever data is important to you, Halcyon allows you to show that. So we try and make it easy for you. And for those of you that are familiar with Halcyon, you'll understand that wherever possible, we try to make it, uh, we try to make templates available. To save you having to create uh, rules, actions, reports from scratch. They give you that initial oomph or that leg up the tree. And it's no different here. So Halcyon's shipped with 25 commonly used reports that can be run with ease. You just need to, on this display here, take option one to run them. Um, or better still, you can set them to be um, auto reports. So just using option six against these, these canned reports mean that any time you do a, a retrieve or a disk build in Halcyon words, um, these reports will automatically be created. So again, we try to save you a bit of work because we know that you've got a day job to do. Now, these reports can be created in a, a variety of different forms. So they could be standard green screen forms in uh, maybe SCS. You can then use other parts in Halcyon to, to pick those up and to convert them or to export them or to push them to a, a CSV format or even convert them to a PDF and have them automatically emailed to you or to a to a team member so that the reports are at or in your inbox or in your desired format when you arrive into work in the morning. You don't need to go hunting for them, they're there in the format that you choose. Now if I share my screen again here, I wanted to show you, we talked at the, at the beginning about green screen and um, whether it's wise to lose the green screen. Now, I'm a huge fan of the green screen, and where possible, I always love to use the, the command line interface. It, it, it's quicker, it's, it, it's right to the point, unless there's a compelling reason why not. Disk Explorer here is, is one, of the, uh, one of the few GUIs that I use day in, day out, and it makes uh, disk-based management across multiple uh, partitions so much easier. And that, that's the one reason I use it. But it's also, it makes it easier if, you're, if IBMI is not your first language, if you're more familiar with Windows or, or Linux or AS. So 
So let's, let's take a look at some of the some of the features, just to give you a flavour for how it looks and feels. Now this this initial display here, I'm uh, I'm just monitoring four partitions here. These are development stroke test partitions here at Help Systems. So I can uh, I can expand these. I can look at um, my ASPs. We've got full um, independent IASP support, so we can drill into IASPs. We can, um, what can we do? We can look at different builds. So if I select uh, one of my test partitions, I can go back to a point in time. I'm not sure how far I can go back here, but I can go back to um, a year ago today, funnily enough, 9th of December. So I can go back a year and I can run comparisons with what happened a year ago to what's happening now. So I can get a look and feel for how things have, uh, how things have grown. Um, as I drill into my data, you'll see here, this is my, my box here, 720p6. And these are my all sys, all user and archive. These are my, what are called applications. So I can open up my archive application, and that's the number of R underscore libraries in, in Halcyon terms. So I group those together. So I can, uh, I might be interested in those. This display might be interesting to me as it is, but I can change this from uh, from gig to meg to terabytes to whatever display makes most sense at the time. And I can print a snapshot. I might produce a display that's going to be useful to me. So I can produce a snapshot if I just preview that. That just produces that snapshot. It, just, it, it generates almost a, a, uh, a visual representation of, of what we're looking at right now. Again, it could be in table, graph, um, whatever format you like there. If we, uh, if we just close that and we go into maybe qsys.lib, as you can see, there's a very small lag. It's not the biggest machine in the world, but there's a very tiny lag while we gather that information. And we'll click on uh, QGPL. Clicked on QGPL and I, I might be interested in uh, properties. I might want to just have a quick um, look and feel. How, how, how has it behaved over the last year, for example? Well, I can see at a glance, I can see the growth. i just move that to one side. I can see how much it's changed at a glance. Again, there's no drilling around Excel or anything like that. It's, it's there and then. So I can print that. Um, I can do all sorts of things with that, but the one thing um, that I think is, is powerful is it looks and feels just like Windows, so it, we don't need to we don't need to know what the underlying operating system is. We just go to appearance and filter. There might be some occasions where you want to subset your display a little bit more. So we've got the ability to create filters and. I've got a filter here, so a filter is just a subset where you can pinpoint uh, maybe sizes of objects. So I'm not interested in anything bigger than 100 meg here. Or you might have a, a date range selection, times that the last things that last created or last changed. That can all be put into a filter, and that filter can then be uh, can then be applied. So if I go to appearance and uh, and apply that filter. And we'll just, uh, you get a little red indicator mark that, uh, that there's a filter been applied. And if I find my QGPL again, I should have picked a library with an A. And just click on that. The only data I see here is objects that are over 100 meg. I've excluded all, all the uh, information I'm not interested in. We can pinpoint that straight away. If we're interested in reporting, I can just do a print report, and that enables me to print the reports that are defined on the green screen. So I do all the hard work on the green screen, I've customised my displays and my reports, and then all of those reports are available from this GUI. Uh, let's have a look. We looked at this library overview one. If I just preview that, um, let's make it a bit bigger maybe. Maybe not a good example. Some of these, some of these numbers are quite big. But you get the idea. 
just point and click and you can get the information you want in a format you desire. And again, table, graph, or both. Lots and lots of, uh, lots and lots of information there. And just some screenshots now. Uh, just a little bit about, uh, about Halcyon and what we do. I'm just conscious of the time. So monitor, automate, report. We've just looked at reporting there. But um, monitoring, our solutions keep a uh, vigilant watch on critical IT systems and core apps on which your business depends. And IT administrators can receive early warnings or uh, potential problems or bottlenecks before they impact the organization. And how do we do that? Well, we do that by setting up automation um, and we set up corrective actions so that these issues do not happen again. Um, and IT teams can also automate regular task checks or jobs that would normally be undertaken by staff. So saving time and ultimately money. And of course, our reporting, cloud-based reporting that provides proof to management that the IT team is achieving or exceeding service levels required by the business, and also flagging any exceptions so that they can be quickly resolved. Now, we've zipped through this today. Half an hour has absolutely flown. But basically, what we've, uh, we've looked at, the kind of early warnings that you can get from the operating system in the form of SST, We've looked at some of the great things that are available free, which is in and around disk tasks. Go to do go disk tasks and you'll get started. We've then looked at how Halcyon takes and pushes these on a notch by enabling you to spot sudden growth spurts. And then finally, looking how to perform trend analysis from both green screen or bringing things into the 21st century from a, from a modern interface. And we've overrun by a couple of minutes, but if you bear with me, I think we've got time for maybe a couple of questions. So let me just go into the Q and A. And if we don't, if we don't answer your uh, questions today, I'm, I'm quite happy to do a, a, a follow up or a follow up call. Now, uh, I've got two questions here. Do uh, don't the multiple builds that Halcyon does occupy lots of disk space? Uh, yes, they can do. Good question. So we've built in maintenance options that enable you to define how long to keep the builds for. So either the number of builds or, or how long they are, or how, sorry, how old they are. So you can define um, when to shrink the builds from uh, maybe to, from uh, member to object to library level over periods. So we've, we've got some, um, some techniques in there to do that. And second question before we wrap up, how long does a Halcyon uh, disk build take Ooh, on my partition, which is uh, a couple of hundred gig. It took about 10 minutes. I think it uses about 10 of a processor, my partition, and it was about 10 minutes. But we do in include some control, whereby you can control how many jobs do the, the initial analysis. So this can be anything from one right up to 99 jobs. So if you just want it to plod in the background, maybe during a, even during a busy time, you can just set it to one and it will just run, but take a number of hours. If you've got a small window and you want it to quick, complete as quick as possible, uh, you can set that to be quite high, maybe not 99, but the option's there. And it then runs and runs within, uh, within minutes and you can then use the, the, the reporting within there. Now, if I have around by four minutes, I think that's, uh, that's Except, well, I would have settled with that beforehand. So I will just thank you for joining me today. And if there's anything else I can help you with in and around this space, or if we can do a, maybe a one-to-one -one just to spend more time in and around particular products, please don't hesitate to contact me. Thank you very much for your time. Goodbye.